Hello, I'm Dr. Russell Barkley, and I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center here in Richmond, Virginia. In this lecture, I want to introduce you to the science-based treatments for ADHD in children and adolescents. This is necessarily going to be just an overview or an introduction uh, because time doesn't permit me to go into great detail about each of the treatments that happen to be available. We think of the ideal treatment package for someone with ADHD as comprising these five components. Obviously, the first is understanding what ADHD is, learning more about its nature, symptoms, its underlying causes or etiologies, its life course and the risks and impairments that an individual might experience if they don't engage in treatment. And then of course, discussing with parents and educators the treatments that are available that have some evidence for their utility as compared to treatments where there either is no evidence or they have been tested and found to be ineffective. So this understanding then results in a reframing of the family and the teacher's perspectives about this particular child, coming to understand that ADHD is a neurological and genetically caused disorder. It is not something that arises purely from social factors. And that it is going to be highly persistent across time in development uh, in most children with ADHD. About two-thirds of them to as many as 84% will continue to be highly symptomatic and impaired by their disorder well into their young adult years. Perhaps maybe 14 to as much as a third might recover from the disorder, but we don't have predictors of that. We don't know who that might be. It depends on how generous you want to define recovery from disorder. And so for that reason, we speak to all families about the persistent nature of ADHD in children. Now, this view of ADHD as comprising a neurodevelopmental disorder should lead to what we expect to be the second component of treatment, and that is a reframing of the family's and the educator's perspective on the child to understand this is a disabled child with a chronic disability. And of course, we hope that that will lead to acceptance of the child for who they really are, not who you want them to be, uh, to compassion, uh, to caring for this child, uh, and then of course to forgiveness, which is to say the ability to let go of the conflict, anger, and so forth that may be associated with the more frequent misbehavior that we are going to see with these particular children. Now, that second component should then lead to consideration of the remaining three. The first, as you see on the right side of my diagram, is medication. In the United States, about 70 to 80 percent of children diagnosed with ADHD will be on medication at some point in their life, perhaps not right away. Families do like to try other things first. But the fact is that the medications are the most effective thing we have for managing ADHD and therefore uh, need to be used with most children. The other things that we will do, the accommodations, the parent training, the behavior modification in school, the curriculum adjustments we might make in school for this child, all of those necessarily are less effective than the medication because they simply don't address the underlying neurological and genetically induced problems that ADHD creates the way medication can do in the brain. So I'll talk about medication because most children will eventually be taking medication for helping to manage their ADHD. The fourth component is going to be introducing parents and teachers to behavior modification, which is to say we're going to change the way they are responding to the child with ADHD in hopes that that will lead 
to changes in the child's behavior. And there's ample evidence to show that changing both the antecedents or the cues that lead uh, or at least precede misbehavior, as well as the consequences that we use and their consistency following that misbehavior or good behavior, uh, then we should alter the probability to some extent of the child showing these good and uh, bad behaviors. And then finally, there are accommodations that we make to the environment. Accommodation refers to physical changes that we make in the situation, the environment, the task, uh, in order to make it more likely that the child can succeed at performing that task. Accommodations don't change the child in terms of getting rid of their disorder. Uh, instead, they change the nature of the task or the requirements of the situation so that the child has a better chance of succeeding in that situation. A, a good example is when we build ramps into buildings to allow physically disabled people in wheelchairs to access the building. Placing the ramp in front of the building does not in any way eliminate the person's disorder. They still have their motor disability, they're still in a wheelchair. But it makes it more likely that they can enter buildings and participate in society to a degree similar to what other people are able to do. They can succeed then. Uh, and that's exactly what we want to do for ADHD children. Change tasks, change expectations, change environments in order that the child might be more successful and be able to participate more effectively in that task and situation. So that's how you should be thinking about the treatment for ADHD, that it involves these five components. Now, we want to intervene as early as possible in the lives of ADHD children with our treatment programs for a variety of reasons. And obviously some of them um, are uh, intuitive and others need some explanation. So clearly we are trying to reduce the level of symptoms that the child is experiencing, not just inattention or hyperactivity or impulsivity, but as I explained in my other lectures, ADHD is more a disorder of the brain's executive functions, uh, and these mental abilities allow people to regulate their own behavior, become independent of others, and see to their long-term welfare, eventually by adulthood, of course. So we're trying to change this whole array of deficits that come with ADHD, and the earlier we can do that, hopefully, the better, for a variety of reasons, <clears throat> not the least of which is by reducing symptoms, and improving impairments, we can reduce the amount of conflict that's going on in families between parents and these very difficult children, the amount of conflict that goes on in schools between teachers and children, of course, and then reduce the amount of stress that everybody's experiencing in those situations uh, that arise from trying to manage a child who's not very well regulated or controlled. And then a third reason is that we are trying to reduce the harm that ADHD creates. What are the adverse consequences that go with ADHD? Uh, we know that there's a variety of them and I've explained them in other lectures, uh, but that our goal is to reduce impairment, to eliminate harm or at least reduce the probability that harm will occur. And harm can refer to ineffective functioning at home, in school, with peers, in the community, and so on. Um, but it can also refer to increased accidental injury and morbidity, uh, and even increased mortality. ADHD children are nearly twice as likely to die from accidental injury by age 10, and adults with ADHD are nearly five times as likely to die by midlife about age 46 if their ADHD is not being managed. And again, that's largely due to accidental injury and some other causes as well. So uh, we're trying to reduce harm. Uh, ADHD therefore is much like a child with diabetes. Uh, we can't get rid of the disorder, but we can manage the symptoms of the disorder and reduce the harmful consequences that come from an unmanaged disorder. And that's what we're trying to do. And the earlier we do that, the better, of course. 
And then there are health-related issues that come along with ADHD, such as sleeping difficulties, obesity, uh, coronary heart disease, risk for substance use and abuse, uh, and so on, that we are trying to reduce as well. So we can list those among the additional harms that ADHD can cause. And as I've explained in other lectures, ADHD is often associated with at least one or two other developmental or psychiatric disorders, the most common being oppositional disorder and learning disabilities, but also to a lesser extent, conduct problems, which includes antisocial behavior, uh, the anxiety and mood disorders, such as anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder. So there's a whole list of other disorders that if ADHD isn't treated early and properly, increase in their likelihood that they will appear and link up with ADHD, in part because ADHD causes some of these other disorders, uh, and in part because the harm that ADHD produces, uh, such as failure in school, can lead to anxiety and depression as well. So the hope here is that we can reduce or eliminate the risk for later disorders, at least to some extent. Uh, and then, of course, ADHD poses a great economic burden on the family financially because of the extra care these children require, the extra medical treatment, the extra psychiatric treatment, uh, the additional educational services they're going to need. All of that is quite costly, uh, both to the family and to society at large. And we hope to reduce those burdens by intervening early. The interventions for ADHD, particularly the medications, have been shown to successfully improve most of the areas of impairment that ADHD children experience, including their increased risk for early death, uh, and therefore will reduce the amount of economic burden they pose to families and society. So uh, there is a financial issue here that we can't overlook, uh, and that is the costliness of unmanaged ADHD for everyone, family, community, society, governments, insurance companies, agencies, and so on. Uh, and finally, there has been in the last 10 years, uh, emerging research, 33 studies at my last count, that show that staying on ADHD medications, particularly the stimulant medications, for at least several years may, in some children, promote brain growth and development in the very areas of the brain where ADHD arises and that are known to be smaller, less connected, and less functional than they should be for the child's age. So there is some normalizing or neuro enhancement that might take place in some children from long-term medication use. And that's a very positive thing. And I hope that research continues to demonstrate that and that we can show that more definitively. Uh, now, I want to emphasize that this does not occur for all children. My examination of the research suggests that perhaps 25 to as many as 45 percent of ADHD children might experience this additional growth and development in these brain areas related to their disorder, uh, but we don't know who that's going to be. We have no predictors of which children will show that. We don't know which medications achieve the best results, what doses of medication are likely to do so, or even how long you need to be on the medication to get those benefits. So this is very early research findings I'm discussing here around this idea of neural growth enhancement or what the research papers call neuro protection. But there's no question that something is going on long term in the brain when it comes to staying on medication. And that makes sense that if the brain is being stimulated every day through these stimulant medications, that we might see some growth taking place within these stimulated regions. So uh, we'll want to pay attention to this development going forward because it's yet another reason why we may want to intervene earlier, particularly with medication, in the lives of ADHD children. Now, the first component of treatment that I mentioned is for families and teachers to come to understand 
what ADHD actually is. And you can see my other lectures uh, that give a overview of ADHD. But what we're trying to do is to make sure that the caregivers, the stakeholders, those involved in managing the child with ADHD and carrying out our treatment plans have a very good understanding of ADHD. As I said, including what ADHD really is, not just its symptoms, but the underlying problems with the brain's executive abilities and self-regulation, what causes ADHD, and as I've said in other lectures, that's principally neurological and genetic uh, factors that are contributing to ADHD risk. What is the life course of ADHD? And along with that, what risks is this child going to uh, be exposed to if we don't get in and manage the ADHD? And then, of course, we want to talk to families and teachers about the science-based treatments, the proven remedies for helping children with ADHD. Along the way, of course, we're going to discuss the unproven treatments that have no evidence for their effectiveness um, one way or the other, <clears throat> and the disproven treatments, which are treatments that have been studied and have found not to be helpful. Uh, the next thing we want families and teachers to understand is that this is a chronic condition. So we need to get used to this child being who they are and the way they are, because they're not going to change. It would be like demanding that somebody in a wheelchair stand up and walk. Well, the demand is ridiculous. Uh, and therefore, we have to accept the disabled person for who they are and what limitations they bring, rather than trying to make them like a normal or typical child or individual. So uh, we want people to understand this is a chronic, unremitting condition for most children, but it can be effectively managed in order to prevent harm happening to this child and to promote, that is to promote the child's success uh, in particular environments. So in that sense, to me, ADHD is the diabetes of psychiatry because diabetes is a similar sort of condition that requires multiple treatments brought to bear to manage the disorder on a daily basis so as to prevent the secondary harms from occurring in the life of that child. And that's precisely what we want to do for ADHD. So I often, in counseling parents and teachers, refer to ADHD as being a comparable disorder to diabetes when it comes to our uh, attitude toward treatment or attitude toward the patient or the child and the things we have to pull together. We have to have lifestyle changes, we have to modify the environment, and we have to increase uh, and maybe introduce the use of medication to help that child with their disorder. Now, in addition to that, we want families to understand that when you tell them that they are going to have a child with a disability, they're going to experience a grief reaction. Anybody would because we've told you that your child has a chronic problem and we're not going to be able to necessarily get rid of that in the sense of curing it as if we were giving you an antibiotic. Instead, what we're going to have to do is adjust ourselves to the disabled person. Uh, and lower our expectations for that disabled person's life uh, and what we can expect them to achieve. And of course, when you tell families that their child is not normal and may not become normal and that life is going to be harder for you and for them, we see families often have a grief reaction uh, because part of the grieving is letting go of your earlier expectations and coming to accept the child for what they are and lower your expectations for that child. Uh, and that leads to the next thing we want to work with families on, and that is how to readjust what they can expect this child to do and to be in given situations and tasks. Uh, and I call this the 30% rule, and it comes out of my theory of ADHD as an executive function disorder a developmental delay in the abilities that we have to control ourselves and our own behavior. And ADHD children don't develop those very well, uh, and they're delayed in their development. And so how delayed are they? Well, 
at one point many years ago, I went through the research available to me, and I just very quickly computed across the various studies how far behind ADHD children were on the various tasks that we were giving them. Uh, and it worked out to be about 25 to 40% or so, roughly, and let's just average that down to about 30%. So the average ADHD child, it seems to me, is about 30% behind in their development when it comes to their executive functioning and self-control. So what does that tell us? All right. Well, that tells us that if we have a child with ADHD who is, say, 10 years of age, then we need to alter the situation, our demands, our expectations, the tasks we give them, to be more suitable to a child who's about seven years of age when it comes to their self-control, their persistence, their ability to sustain their actions and inhibit being distracted, their ability to control their emotions, all of these different deficits that go with ADHD, we need to alter the situation to be more consistent with their executive age and not their chronological age. Because you see, a large part of the conflict that we see between teachers and children with this disorder, or even uh, parents and teachers as well, is we see that the conflict is arising from a difference in expectations and what the child is capable of doing. And as long as you expect children to do things they can't do, you're going to be unhappy, you're going to be angry, you're going to be frustrated, they're going to be frustrated, they're also going to feel belittled and stigmatized. Uh, and uh, that's not a good situation for anyone to be in. And the best way to eliminate those problems is to change your expectations and make them more consistent with the child you have and not the child you want. So that's where the 30% rule comes in. And you can apply the 30% rule to many, many situations in life. In fact, there's not uh, any setting or demand or task that we ask ADHD children to do that would not benefit from us rethinking what we're asking the child to do from the standpoint of the 30% rule. I'll just give you one example. Uh, in the United States, at age 16, it is quite common for teenagers to want to get a driver's license so they can eventually independently drive a motor vehicle. It's a very big deal over here for teenagers. Now, let's say you have an ADHD teenager and they're turning 16. Well then, do you let them drive a car? And obviously, that should cause or cause some doubt in your mind about whether we're going to allow them to do it, how we're going to allow them to do it, how much supervision, how much training, uh, and what limitations we're going to place on that privilege if we do allow them to drive independently. So notice how it makes you really think through what's involved in driving, how independent they should be, what about the distraction from smart technology like cell phones in the car, a big problem even for typical teenagers. How are we going to address all of that when we're giving a driver's license to somebody with the self-control of an 11-year-old? That's right. 30% from 16 puts it down to about 10 to 11 years of age. We would never let 10 or 11 year olds drive a car. So you see what I'm talking about? Uh, if we are going to allow that, then we have to change the situation so that the children are not in harm's way. And that's what the 30% rule allows you to do. And I want educators to employ the rule just as much as families when it comes to what are you asking this child to do in your classroom. Now, another important concept that comes out of my theory of ADHD is that ADHD is not a problem with knowing what to do, how to act, what the rules are. In general, most children with ADHD know what other children their age already know. I mean, after all, they've been in the same culture, they've been watching television, they've had smart technology, they've been raised by adequate parents, they've gone to school, so clearly they're not stupid. Uh, the problem with ADHD is that they can't use the knowledge they have to effectively control their own behavior and accomplish the tasks and expectations we have for them. That's a performance problem, performing what you know, where and when in your life it would have been wise to do so. And that's what ADHD disrupts. It dis disconnects the knowing brain from the performance brain. 
making ADHD a problem with doing what we know, not knowing what to do. What, what does that mean? It means that we have to stop trying to teach ADHD out of a child. So if an ADHD child has trouble with organization and time management, we don't just sit down and go over, this is how you manage time, this is how you organize. I mean, we certainly can do that, but to expect that that alone would result in remarkable changes in a child is ludicrous. Uh, you're just asking for way too much because you've missed the point. You're giving knowledge to this child and you're just assuming they're going to be able to use it in the places where it would be wise to do so. And that's what they can't do. They can't take what you have taught them and apply it independently out there in the real world where it matters. We call that, say, that place out there where it matters the point of performance, the place of performance, the point in time where what you know should be informing what you're doing, and it's not. So what does that mean? We have learned from hundreds of research studies that only treatments that occur at that point in the natural environment are effective for helping ADHD children. If you take an ADHD child and send them to a psychiatrist for weekly psychotherapy, that will have no benefits out there in school, at home, in the places where the child is having problems. There'll be no generalization, no maintenance, no carryover. The time should have been put into reorganizing that situation to help the ADHD child perform what they know how to act, what the duel, what the rules were, what the expectations are. Uh, and so the point of intervention is changing these various places in the natural setting of that child where problems occur so that problems don't occur or at least are less likely to occur. And that's what we mean by intervention at the point of performance. So stop spending so much time teaching the ADHD child what you think they don't know. You'd be surprised what they do know and spend more time reorganizing, structuring the point of performance with additional support, if necessary, what I call scaffolding, right? in order that they can be more successful at that point. And that's the goal of treatment. And the reason medication works is that medication is in the brain in the bloodstream, in the body, at these points of performance. And it is actively changing the brain at these places of performance. Whereas things like social skills training at a clinic on a Saturday morning isn't going to change anybody's life, that child's life in particular. And similarly, as I said, going in for play therapy once a week to a therapist is not going to change the problems we're all experiencing with this child in these various places in their life. So it is crucial that caregivers understand, parents and teachers that is, understand that all intervention, if it's going to work, is done in the natural setting. And that means you are the ones who have to do this. You are, after all, the caregivers. You are the ones who are out there. So we have to work with you on how you can change the problems you're complaining about so that that situation is improved. And that's the goal of intervention. Certainly when we explain to you that your child has a chronic disability, we want parents and teachers to come to accepting the child for who they are, as I've already mentioned, but also becoming an advocate for their handicapped child for their disordered youngster, so that no one advocates for your child the way you will, because it's your child. Uh, and therefore, it's important that you seek out the important resources that are going to be available in your community in order to help improve the life of this child. And that requires actively investigating, learning, exploring where these places are. Uh, and so that is what we want families to be able to do, advocate. In addition, research is coming to show that exercise does seem to help ADHD children even more than it helps 
children with other psychological problems. Uh, it's a temporary measure, but it does help to reduce their symptoms. It does help to improve their self-control for a while. And so we want the child with ADHD to be involved in regular routine physical exercise. Uh, and that includes not just sports and movement of large muscle groups as in running or tennis or uh, soccer or football, but also uh, even micro movements while they're working. Uh, if they have a task to do like homework or schoolwork at their desk, they could have a tennis ball or a rubber ball in their left hand and be actively squeezing it and rolling it and playing with it while they're working because movement seems to help them concentrate better. Uh, and then we want to teach families, as I said, uh, the proven and unproven or disproven remedies. And I'll talk about those in this presentation. Now, the next component, as I said, after understanding ADHD and after coming to accept uh, and work with your ADHD child uh, is medication. And about 70 to 80 percent of children are likely going to need medication as part of a larger treatment package that we put together for them. Uh, so, you know, parents may wonder, well, why are we medicating? Well, one reason is, is that medications are the most effective treatment out there, bar none. I mean, they are two to three times better than any of the other treatments that we're going to do. So we need them. Uh, like insulin for the diabetic, as I've already mentioned, we need to consider the ADHD medication. So if your child uh, or a, your student in school has at least moderate or greater levels of ADHD, they're probably going to need medication. If not right away, then certainly within the next six months to the next several years. But most families eventually come back to us to try medication if they didn't want to try it originally. We have hundreds, if not thousands, of research studies on the safety and the effectiveness of these medications for helping to manage ADHD. So we're quite confident in our conclusions about this being a very clearly science-based established intervention. And I'll talk more about the medication shortly. As I've said, their safety is incredibly well established. And while they have annoying side effects that I will briefly mention, none of them are life-threatening. None of them are going to cause brain damage or lead to other problems. And I'll address some of those misunderstandings later in this lecture. We know that ADHD medication improves behavior in up to 90% of people who try these medications. We know that up to 50 to 60% of them are in fact completely normalized. That is, become very similar to a typical child when they are on these medications. The remainder are improved, but not necessarily normalized and will need other interventions. And about three to 10% of ADHD children simply do not benefit from the medication or have adverse re reactions enough that they simply need to stop the medication. So the vast majority of children with ADHD and teens benefit significantly from taking the ADHD medications. Another advantage is that they're very convenient to administer so that the child uh, simply has to take them once a day. These are long acting medications that typically last anywhere from eight to 10 hours in the case of stimulants to as long as uh, 18 to 24 hours in the case of the non-stimulant atomoxetine and the other non-stimulants we have here in the United States. So uh, they're very long acting medications. So we only have to give them once uh, usually, uh, and then uh, the child can go about their day. Uh, and the medications can actually help in places where you can't be present. Uh, they also, uh, I think, allow us to combine our medications with psychological treatments and therefore use less of the medication uh, and less, uh, uh, that is a lower dose, uh, and maybe even use it less often. So combining ADHD with psychosocial treatment can be helpful. Let's also not forget that while medications have side effects, psychosocial treatments have side effects too. Uh, in about 15 to 20% or more, 
of families with ADHD children. So, you know, the psychological treatments I'm going to discuss today are not benign. Some people don't react well to them, uh, children in particular. So I'll mention that briefly. Uh, certainly medication is less expensive than these more burdensome psychological treatments that require other people to implement them in the natural setting every day. Uh, and that can get pretty costly when other people have to expend more time and effort and more resources to help this child. So another reason for medication is it reduces cost and burden on the family and on others who have to help this child. These medicines can be used for years well into adulthood, so uh, they can certainly uh, help benefit teenagers, young adults, older adults with ADHD uh, when they are used with them. And again, not everybody responds, but most people do. Uh, and the medication can be active out there in the community where a parent and a teacher simply can't be. The example I gave of a teenager driving a motor vehicle by themselves is a very good example of how medication taken while driving can improve the driving and reduce the risks from driving that ADHD causes uh, that can't be done by any other means. Uh, you can't be with that teenager all the time when they're in the community. Uh, and so medications can help cover times of the day and the week when the child is less supervised or not supervised at all. And then, as I've already mentioned, taking medication, particularly early and sustaining that medication for several years, possibly might result in enhanced brain growth and development. So for all of these reasons, we like to try medication with ADHD children, that is with most of them, uh, unless they have very mild ADHD. Okay, so the ADHD medications that we have available uh, in the United States are the stimulants, of which there are two kinds. We have methylphenidate, but we also have the amphetamines. And I know other countries only have methylphenidate. They haven't yet allowed amphetamines to be prescribed. But the amphetamines uh, are twice as potent uh, and more effective than methylphenidate. So that's why we allow them to be used here. But obviously, these are controlled substances, and they have to be prescribed and supervised properly according to government regulations. Now, in our country, anyway, there have been a number of new developments in these medications. Now, we haven't discovered any new stimulants. These medications have been around for 60 to 90 years in the United States. Um, <clears throat> what we have seen in the past 20 years or so has been the development of different delivery systems that allow the medication to remain active in the body for much longer periods of time than the original pills could do, because the pills were immediate release medications. And therefore, although they activated very quickly, usually within 30 minutes or so, they only lasted about three to five hours. And so children and teens had to take their medication at least two to three times a day to adequately cover the entire waking day. Uh, and that led to a lot of problems. They had to take their medication at school, and schools don't necessarily like giving these medications or storing them at the nurse's office or letting the child leave school or leave the classroom, rather, to go to the nurse to get their medication. As I said, these are also, in most countries, controlled substances, and schools just didn't want to be responsible for these potentially abusable medications. Uh, and then, of course, by taking medication three times a day, you see this sort of a roller coaster ride where the medication's active, then it's declining, then it's active, then it's declining. And that's not a very good way of administering a medication therapy to somebody. It would be nice if we could have a more even and continuous blood level of the medicine. And that is what these delivery systems do. So just to acquaint you with them, because you may have some of them in your own country, though probably not all of these, um, we have the immediate release pills, which have been around for decades. We have an osmotic pump in our country. The brand name is Concerta. Uh, this is a little capsule that has a gelatin of methylphenidate in it. Uh, and when you swallow the capsule, water goes into the upper part of the capsule and pushes down like on a bicycle pump or a tube of toothpaste and squeezes out the liquid methylphenidate over a period of about eight to 10 hours. It, it's an ingenious invention and it results in medication being continuously 
um, ejected or squeezed from the capsule and therefore being available to become activated and control behavior. So uh, a very good extended release form of methylphenidate. Uh, we also have these time release pellets where pellets of the medicine have different coatings on them of different thickness and they dissolve at different times of the day. Uh, and that allows the medication to stay in the body longer with a more even blood level. Uh, you might know these drugs as uh, a Focalin or Metadate uh, for methylphenidate, for instance, or Adderall XR in the case of amphetamine. Uh, and there are others too, I'm only mentioning a few. In the US, but not so much in other countries, we have a skin patch available that you can wear on your shoulder or on your buttocks. Uh, and the methylphenidate enters the body through the skin uh, and is absorbed into the bloodstream and works quite well. Uh, some people get a, a skin rash from it and can't use it, but most people can use it successfully. You just have to remember to take the patch off several hours before bedtime so that the child can fall asleep. But otherwise, another extended release delivery system. Now, here in the US, particularly for the amphetamines, uh, a new delivery system was invented uh, about 11 years ago, and this is called a prodrug, and the brand name is Vivance. Uh, and it's called a prodrug simply because you take the medication, the amphetamine, you lock it up with another compound, lysine in this case, so that the amphetamine simply can't work except when you put it in a place where there's another chemical, like an enzyme, available that removes the lock, the lysine, and now the amphetamine can work. Now, why did the company do that? The company did that to try to reduce the abuse potential, that is the attractiveness of this medication for drug abusers out there in the community, because the drug will only work in the stomach and intestine as it crosses the lining, there is in the bloodstream there an enzyme that is known to strip away the lysine, and that activates the amphetamine. And this drug lasts about eight to 12, sometimes more hours across the day. Uh, so it's a very interesting new delivery system for amphetamine. We also have in our country liquid versions of methylphenidate and amphetamine, and including liquid versions of long-acting uh, types of this medicine. We have oral dissolvable tablets or jellies, some people call them gummy bears like candy, uh, that dissolve in the mouth. Uh, and then most recently, a year ago in June of 2019, uh, a new delivery system came on the market in which you take the medicine at night and it activates nine hours later as the child is waking up. And this delayed onset extended release form of methylphenidate was invented because the morning hours can be very troublesome for families. Even if their children take these other medicines, the child has to be awoken early. The child has to be given the medication. The medication might take 45 minutes to an hour or longer before it activates and produces a therapeutic benefit. And therefore, these other medicines have a problem with early morning functioning. The child is essentially not medicated or under medicated until the drugs activate. And so this company invented a delayed onset but extended release system that lasts the whole day once it activates. And that is now uh, becoming more popular here in the United States. Now, another development uh, has been the discovery that we can use these medications safely into the younger preschool age group. Whereas previously, these medicines were only approved for children five or six years of age or older, um, we went out and a number of studies were done, including a large government-funded study of preschool children looking at methylphenidate at its safety and its effectiveness down to age two. And that study found, uh, very briefly, uh, that the drugs are safe and that the drug is effective and that it can be used if needed in preschool children without concern. Now, there were a couple of findings that were different from what we see in school-age children. First of all, preschoolers had somewhat more of the common side effects of the medicine. 
than school-age children do. Um, second, we found that somewhat fewer of the preschool children actually had a positive response, whereas about 75% of school-age children respond to methylphenidate, it was about 55% of the preschool children. So still many children benefited, but not as many as school age children, suggesting that age may be related to the likelihood of getting a positive response. The older the child becomes, the greater the likelihood that they will have a positive response to the medicine, at least going from the preschool to the school age. Now beyond school age, uh, age doesn't matter. But at that young early preschool developmental period, it looks like age may be important here. The third thing that that study found, the big government study I'm talking about, is that um, a larger percentage of children, not many, but a larger percent, simply couldn't tolerate the methylphenidate. So whereas about 3% of school-age children simply cannot take this medicine because it produces adverse reactions that are considerable, um, we found it was about 8 to 10 percent in that research study of preschool children. So a slightly higher likelihood of simply not tolerating the medicine. But wait a couple of years, come back and try it again, uh, and it might work or you might get a better response. So we have learned that if it is necessary to manage very difficult ADHD children as preschoolers, these medications, methylphenidate specifically, can be quite effective and helpful in doing so. Now, obviously, we would want to combine the medication with the behavioral programs I'm going to talk about next, but uh, we can use medication there. Now, there's also Stratera, which is the drug atomoxetine, which has been available in our country since around 2003. And it's been very, very well studied. Again, lots of research on it. Uh, and it is quite effective for managing ADHD children and teens. In our country, it's also approved for adults. Uh, now, atomoxetine, Stratera, is not a stimulant. Right? Uh, it is not a controlled substance. It has no abuse potential. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's uh, quite a different medication. It works in the brain by making more of the chemical norepinephrine available. That's what NE stands for on my slide. Uh, it is a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, uh, which simply means that when a nerve cell fires and releases the chemical, the norepinephrine, the pumps that are around the nerve cell that pull the chemical back in are blocked, are inhibited. And that allows more of the medication, more of the norepinephrine, that is, to remain available and to activate. Um, so this is a non-stimulant uh, that works for about 75% of ADHD children. The degree of improvement you get from it is not quite as good as what you get from the stimulants, but still pretty good. Uh, very similar to what you get with methylphenidate, not quite as good as what we get from an amphetamine. But just as many people respond, 75%, and just as many may be uh, benefiting and even normalized from the medication. Uh, but again, it's a different drug, which means that if some children don't respond to methylphenidate, they still have a chance of responding to this medication quite well. In fact, about 50 to 60% of children who couldn't take methylphenidate for whatever reason still had a positive response to Stratera. Now, in our country, I know many countries don't have this yet, but in our country, there are two other non-stimulants available. These are drugs that originally were invented to treat high blood pressure. So they're anti-hypertensive medicines. Uh, and they've been reformulated to last a lot longer across the day. Uh, and they are the drugs guanfacine and clonidine. And they also work by a very different method in the brain than does Stratera or the stimulant medications. Uh, these are good third choice medicines, particularly for children who are very active, explosive, uh, aggressive, because they do produce some sedation uh, in them or as a result of taking them, at least for a while. And so some people use them 
to help with these very difficult and very active children, especially where the stimulants or other drugs are not working. Uh, also, we're learning that you might be able to combine them with the other stimulants, but I won't talk much about that because uh, most countries don't have these medications available except here, maybe uh, a little bit in, in Europe. Now, on the horizon, there are discoveries going on that suggest we might see some new medications. Some drug companies have been playing around with the nicotine um, compound and the nicotine receptor in the brain uh, because nicotine in tobacco does produce positive effects, benefits for ADHD, which we think is why people with ADHD drift towards smoking and smoking more than other people do who use tobacco. Uh, but so far, the companies exploring these nicotinic uh, receptor drugs have not had much success with them. So not sure when that's going to happen. Uh, we also have other norepinephrine drugs like Stratera that are undergoing um, research right now uh, that are even more selective for norepinephrine than Stratera is, and they're being explored by other drug companies too. So maybe eventually we'll have another uh, form of a norepinephrine inhibitor on the market as well. Uh, and then, of course, there is the discoveries going on in genetics that as we learn more about the genes that create risk for ADHD and what those genes do in the brain, uh, we may then be able to work back from that mechanism to what kind of drug would help uh, with that problem in the brain. So uh, genetics is going to be informing drug development, uh, which it is already, uh, and so we might see new discoveries in the future. Now, the benefits of medication, particularly stimulant medications, are numerous. And I'm just going to list these for you because of time, but we have lots of studies showing improved attention, concentration, persistence over tasks, self-motivation, a reduction in impulsiveness. They're less uh, impulsive, more inhibited, a marked reduction in restless, off-task, hyperactive behavior. It improves the amount of work children are able to do uh, on various tasks, including on schoolwork. There's a little bit of improvement in accuracy, but accuracy is not the problem that ADHD creates. It's production. People with ADHD simply don't get a lot of work done. What little work they do is often correct, but they're just not doing an awful lot. So it's not surprising then to see that productivity improves much more than accuracy. We find that children are able to go to school on more days because they're less problematic uh, in school, that they often may find benefits to their reading achievement and comprehension because they're able to hold in mind what they're reading and get more out of what they're reading. And eventually that will improve their knowledge of what they're reading and their reading achievement. So uh, we might see that happening as children get older. They're less likely to be held back in school, less likely to be punished in school. They have better emotional control. Uh, they're less aggressive more compliant with requests, show a decrease in antisocial, delinquent, or criminal behavior, uh, and are also um, less likely to turn toward drug use and drug abuse in adolescence if they stay on their medication during the adolescent years. So that's quite a lot to expect from a medication. And we have ample studies that show these and other benefits accrue, such as improved rule following, more independent work. The child is able to be left alone to get their work done more often. The child remembers more. They're able to hold in mind what they're told to do and carry it out. There's more improvement in internal speech, the mind's voice, and its ability to guide behavior. Of course, we see that the original deficits in motor control and handwriting that go with ADHD are often improved as well by the medication. And as a result of all these other improvements and because of the success that they're allowing the child to experience, ADHD children on medication often feel better about themselves, uh, about how they're functioning uh, in their lives. So uh, some children show improved self-esteem. And as I've already pointed out, 
Uh, they are less punished by parents and teachers because they're better behaved. They're more acceptable to their peers and therefore have better interactions with peers. And hopefully that leads to having more friendships and being invited out more to do things with other children. We have a number of studies showing better sports participation, particularly awareness of what is happening in the game or the sport that you're playing. Uh, and for children, that's very important because sports is a major component of children's lives. Here in the United States, uh, we see improved driving, improved reaction time while driving. All of this results in a reduced risk of automobile crashes, as well as a reduced risk for accidental injuries of all kinds in children and adults with ADHD. And that lowers the risk of death in these children. And that's a very important thing. We have medicines that can prevent early injury and early death in these children. And then we've also found that where ADHD occurs with other disorders like oppositional disorder, conduct disorder, autism spectrum disorder, the drugs are beneficial at managing the ADHD, even if they don't impact the symptoms of autism uh, directly or beneficially, they do manage the ADHD even where these other coexisting disorders um, happen to be occurring in a particular child. Now, as I said, there are side effects to these medications. I'm going to talk about the stimulant ones in particular. Uh, these are quite annoying, but they're benign. Uh, nobody dies from these particular side effects. The uh, old idea uh, that children may experience sudden death from taking these medicines simply has not been borne out in very large studies involving entire populations of countries and large databases. So uh, we're simply not seeing that as a consequence. And I'll talk about some of the other misconceptions that people have with the stimulants in a moment, but that's one I want to get out of the way right away. These are safe, effective, benign medicines. But that's not to say they don't have side effects. They do. And sometimes the side effects are significant enough that three to five percent of children may have to stop the medication. But most or all of the side effects, if they do occur, uh, are related to the dose. So if you lower the dose, there's a good chance that the side effect might be diminished or eliminated. Uh, if not, then we can switch to a different medicine and see if the side effects occur with that medicine. Because just because a child doesn't do well on one type of medicine, like methylphenidate, does not tell us anything about how they will react to another type of medicine, like Stratera, or in our country, like the amphetamine. So you can't predict response across all ADHD drugs just from giving one type of drug. The same is true, by the way, with the different delivery systems. So just because a child didn't do well on one kind of delivery system doesn't necessarily mean they might not do well on another type. Now, the most common side effects for the stimulants, uh, like methylphenidate, are uh, insomnia, delayed onset of sleep, uh, a reduction of appetite, especially for the noon meal, with some recovery of appetite by late afternoon and early evening, uh, a headache in about 20% of children, and stomach ache. And again, these can be mitigated to some extent by taking the medicine with some food, uh, or by lowering the dose, or by switching to a different medication. Uh, some less common side effects, but common enough that some children show them. Uh, about one in 10 children uh, complains of being somewhat irritable late in the day, in particular when the medicine is washing out. Other children become a little bit more emotional, particularly at that time of the day, as the medicine wears out, they may be more prone to tearfulness or crying. Some children show an increase in their nervous habits, like biting their nails or picking their nails or twisting their hair or something like that. So these little nervous mannerisms might increase a little bit from the stimulant. Uh, children who already have a tick reaction may find an increase in their nervous muscle twitches that they might have, such as eye blinking or squinting or something like that. Uh, but that's quite rare. That's well below 10% of children. Uh, usually it's around 3% might experience a tick reaction. And even then, those are children who were prone to develop a tick disorder, either because they already had one or because other family members have tick disorders and they're genetically more prone to develop them as well. But it's very rare. And as the Tourette Syndrome Society, Tourette's is a very complex pattern of tics and vocal noises. 
uh, as the Tourette Society in our country has, uh, uh, has discovered, it is okay to give stimulants to children who have nervous tics because most of them, it doesn't worsen their tic disorder. In about 30% or more of children with tics, it may make them worse, in which case you have to stop the medicine and the tics will go back to their original level, usually. But um, where the tics don't go back to the usual level, it probably wasn't the medicine that produced the increase in the tics. It can just come with age. Tics do increase with development in some children, particularly if they're going on to develop Tourette syndrome. Uh, and so it could have been that and not the medication. But in any case, you can use the drugs with children with tics and, and mannerisms. Um, a side effect that we were very concerned about was a failure to grow, both in weight uh, and in height or skeletal stature. And research shows that yes, this does happen. On average, children fail to gain about one to four pounds a year from being on the medicine, which they otherwise would have gained if they weren't on the medicine, and uh, about one centimeter less in height. So the children don't shrink, right? They're not losing weight. What happens is they don't grow as quickly their trajectory or rate of growth slows down a little bit. Now, uh, this is very minor. Uh, it's not something we are very concerned about, and it's temporary. It may last only one or two years, uh, and then by later childhood, and certainly before adolescence, the child recovers back to their normal trajectory, and we see no adverse effect going forward of any long-term uh, impact on growth problems. Children who took stimulants uh, as adults uh, are where we would expect them to be had they never taken a stimulant. So uh, it's a transient effect on growth that can last several years. And obviously it's a concern when you're dealing with very small children who may already have growth problems, that is children who are small for their age, uh, and where we might want to institute uh, a drug holiday. So off of your medicine on weekends, off during the summer to give you a chance to gain that growth back again. But where the growth is minor, the growth problem that is, is minor or non-existent, then we don't do drug holidays. We want children on their medication seven days a week, just as you would not stop giving insulin to a diabetic on the weekend, you should not stop giving these medicines to ADHD children either because there are risks from their ADHD being unmanaged in the community and home environment, even out of school. Uh, indeed, the risk of accidental injury is even greater. So we want to make sure that the children are being medicated most, if not all of the week, unless they're having significant growth delay where we then institute uh, a drug holiday. Now, some critics of these drugs claim that they cause cancer, uh, usually through breaking chromosomes in blood or excuse me, in uh, blood cells. Uh, that was found to be uh, completely absurd or ridiculous. Some people claim that they cause birth defects in the offspring of people who took them. We have not seen that in research studies at this time. So uh, again, a lot of these criticisms turned out to be baseless. Uh, a few other side effects that we want to keep an eye on. There's a slight increase in heart rate, very little increase in blood pressure, nothing to be worried about with uh, a child unless they already have high blood pressure, in which case nobody wants to increase blood pressure where it's already uh, at a, a very uh, severe level. And in our country, uh, African-American males have a higher risk for high blood pressure, and therefore we would want to screen them in particular. But that is why physicians will check heart rate and blood pressure before prescribing these medications. Less than 2% of ADHD children and adults uh, experience what is called a stimulant psychosis from taking these medicines. So it's very rare, uh, but usually what we see is they develop some kind of hallucination. In the case of children, it's often uh, the feeling of insects crawling on the skin. It's a tactile hallucination, but it can be auditory or even visual, especially in older people. Uh, this is drug related uh, and some people simply can't tolerate the drug. And if you stop the medicine, the stimulant psychosis uh, will go away. It might take a few hours until the drug is out of the body 
Uh, if it's important to do so, the child can go to an emergency room and another drug can be given that blocks the action of the stimulant. Hopefully they will recover from their psychosis much quicker that way. But it's time limited. Uh, it's not something we're, we're very concerned about, and very, very few children experience that. But it is out there. So, as I've said, there are no discernible long-term detrimental effects from staying on these medications for years and years. We've done many follow-up studies of children into adulthood, and we have not detected in any way any kind of physical, emotional, or psychological adverse effects from taking these medications, including, as I've already said, the risk of sudden death, which has been found in several large studies um, to be no different in people taking stimulants than children who don't take stimulants. After all, a very, very tiny percentage of people simply have heart block and die from sudden death. And it has nothing to do with stimulants, and certainly ADHD children carry the same very rare low risk. But the medication has nothing to do with that problem. Now, there are a number of misconceptions that people have about the medicines. Excuse me for a moment, and then we can talk about them. One of them that families often come in with is that these drugs are addictive and I don't want my child to take them because I fear that they will be sensitized to become addicted to this and other stimulant medications as they get older. We have absolutely no evidence that children taking oral stimulants the way we're prescribing them for children with ADHD or teens or adults ever become addicted to the medication. There's just no evidence of that. To develop an addiction, you would have to crush the tablet and inject it into your bloodstream or inhale it nasally like people do with cocaine. And then of course it's entering the brain very quickly and it's that rapid entry into the brain that is correlated with risk of addiction. And the oral drugs that are taken through the stomach simply don't do that. <clears throat> so the risk of addiction is very low, but there's still the potential for other people to abuse the drug by transforming it into a different way and getting it into their body. So drug users can do that, but we don't see that happening with people being prescribed ADHD medications when they take them orally. Now, <clears throat> It was claimed that these stimulants might cause an increase in aggression. They do not. They actually decrease aggression. Children with ADHD, when they're not treated, show high rates of aggression, particularly reactive aggression when they're frustrated, upset, or provoked by others. Uh, so that's already high in ADHD children, and we see in our studies that the medication lowers that risk. So again, that's another mythology that we see about these drugs. There was some belief that these drugs might cause seizures, particularly at higher doses. We have no evidence of that at all. <clears throat> the drugs can be taken quite safely without provoking seizures or epilepsy. There was a concern that you couldn't give the drugs to children who already had a seizure disorder, because again, it might increase probability of a new seizure. Uh, and we've studied children with epilepsy or seizure disorders now who have ADHD and we've given them stimulants and we see no increase uh, in their seizure frequency and certainly no significant changes in their EEG or electroencephalogram. So we can get rid of that misconception as well. <clears throat> I've already dealt with this one. Do the stimulants cause Tix or Tourette syndrome in children who don't have it already? Uh, the answer is no. You, you don't get Tourette's from a stimulant. But if you already have a tick or you already have Tourette's, about 30% of those people might find that their tick gets worse on the stimulant. But a third of them might find that the tick doesn't increase. And uh, we also find that about a third of them uh, it actually improves the tick frequency. So that is why we now give stimulants to children who have both ADHD and a tick disorder, as I've already said, uh, because we don't worry so much about causing ticks in children with this condition. Uh, are we using too much medication with ADHD children? Uh, no, every time we do a study, we find actually it's the opposite. Many children, particularly children being prescribed drugs by 
physicians, family practitioners, pediatricians who are not child psychiatrists tend to underdose children relative to what the children should be taking uh, compared to what psychiatrists uh, would use or what clinical researchers like myself might use in our research. Um, most children are being slightly under medicated and can benefit from a little bit more medication. Indeed, when children come to us and their parents say, I don't think my child responds to this medicine, the first thing we do is increase the dose because usually that's what the problem was. You just weren't using enough of, of the medication. Uh, so no evidence that we're overdosing. Are we, excuse me, are we overusing these prescriptions? That is, are too many children being given these, uh, such as normal children or uh, children who are mildly symptomatic but don't have ADHD? When we do studies, we simply don't find that to be the case. In the United States, roughly about 4 to 5% of children are taking these medications, and the prevalence of ADHD in the United States in children is about 7 to 8%, roughly. Uh, and so, you know, we continue to see that fewer children are on medication than have the disorder. That's clearly evidence that we're not over prescribing. It doesn't mean that some doctor somewhere in some little community might not be giving away too much medication to too many children. Uh, that certainly can happen. But w there's nothing on a regional or a national scale that we see as problematic. I've already addressed this. Do the drugs create a risk for later substance abuse? No. We have many studies showing no increase in risk. ADHD, when it's not treated, does increase the risk of abusing or using tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs. So it's the disorder that is creating the risk. The medication doesn't make that risk any higher. And if the child takes medication during the adolescent years, some studies show actually a reduction in risk for substance use. So you don't need to be concerned about that. That's just a non-issue right now. Um, and people earlier in uh, our country, particularly researchers, including me, uh, used to be concerned that the stimulant medicines, although they were improving behavior at school and they were improving productivity and the amount of work done in school, weren't improving the test grades of ADHD children, the academic achievement scores that children earn by taking tests in their subject matter, such as reading, spelling, arithmetic, history, and so on. Uh, well, it turned out that the reason for that is that all of the studies were very short-term studies, lasting only a matter of weeks to several months. Uh, and so, yes, we were getting all of these immediate improvements in school but we weren't seeing any change in test scores. Now we have longer studies that have gone on for 18 months to as long as two to three years. We also have follow-up studies like mine that have followed children up into adulthood. And there we do see some improvement in achievement scores. You just have to stay on the medicine for long enough to benefit in your subjects. Uh, so uh, even this has turned out to be a overrated concern. Now, let's turn to the psychological treatments for ADHD and look at those. Excuse me. Why do we want to do psychological treatments? If the drugs are so great and they're producing all of these benefits across all these domains and most people can take them without uh, problems, uh, then why don't we just do that? Uh, and indeed, that's possible. I mean, some children don't need any other treatment besides medicine. Though, in my experience, that's probably only about one in five ADHD children. The rest are going to need something else besides the medication, and for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that as children grow up, we find that their likelihood of staying on medication drops sharply, and they don't adhere or comply with the medication uh, any longer. Uh, and this can happen even within the first year. Often the reason for this is, at least in our country, the drugs are expensive and families don't want to pay for them anymore. Or the family finds that the side effects are just too annoying. Uh, or the child doesn't like them and doesn't want to stay on them. So even though they're getting benefits, particularly at school, at home they're seeing mainly the side effects and so they stop the medicine. Another reason, however, is that as children grow up and become teenagers, they want more of a say or influence in what happens to them. 
And so they're not blindly willing to simply take medication because you tell them to. You have to convince them to take it, they have to be persuaded, and they have to be motivated to take it. And a lot of children with ADHD when they reach adolescence aren't. They simply don't want to do that. So they're able to stop the medicine. Even if the parents want them to take the medicine, uh, they can avoid it. Uh, and so that's another reason we see that. So, you know, that's why clinicians often have to sit down and talk with the family, talk with the children, meet with them periodically in order to address these concerns that are leading to medication cessation. Um, another reason we use psychological treatments is that by combining them with medication, as I've said, we get the most ideal, the most optimal treatment response. We get more effectiveness, and often it means we have to use less of each kind of treatment when we combine them. So that's, that's good news. Uh, we also need psychological treatments for the times of the day when parents and teachers have to manage a child with ADHD and the medication has worn off or the child simply isn't taking the medication. And so we have to prepare these other caregivers for what to do, and those are the psychological treatments. ADHD children also are likely to have another coexisting disorder. About 80% of them, in fact, have at least another disorder. And many times the medication can't treat that disorder, like a learning disability or major depression or an anxiety disorder. The ADHD medicines don't help those disorders very much, if at all. So if a child has <clears throat> one of these coexisting disorders, we're still gonna have to do other treatments, usually educational or psychological ones, to address the learning problem, the anxiety, or the depression. So comorbidity or a coexisting disorder can lead to needing psychological remedies for that. Uh, as I've said, combining psychological treatment with medicine can result in lower doses. That's a good thing uh, and less expense for the medication. There are certain subgroups of people with ADHD and their families where we are going to have to do additional psychological treatment. Let's suppose there's a lot of problems in the family. Maybe the parents have a psychiatric disorder or ADHD specifically. Uh, maybe the family is not well educated and therefore needs a lot more time and attention from the uh, physician or the professional. Then we're going to need to spend more time and more psychological treatment with them. Finally, research shows clearly that parents and teachers don't like us to simply give medication and do nothing else. Uh, they find that the treatments we offer are more acceptable if the medication is combined with doing other things to help that child. And that's important because if parents don't accept what we're recommending, then they won't do it. And so we need to uh, address that acceptability. And one way to do that is by doing some additional psychological assistance for the child and the family. So <clears throat> let's take a look at these psychological treatments. Now, one I've already talked about is educating parents and teachers about ADHD so that they better understand it. That was step one or the first component of our treatment package. The second thing we do is to teach parents very specific strategies around child behavior management. How to give commands better, how to structure tasks differently so they're more suitable to this child, how to use rewards and other positive consequences, as well as approval and praise to increase positive behavior and compliance and task completion. And then if necessary, how to use penalties and punishments quickly and effectively for the child with ADHD. So these parent training programs are numerous. I'll come back and show you some of them shortly, um, but they're quite good. They mostly help lower parent-child conflict. They're not so good at lowering traditional formal ADHD symptoms because it makes sense. ADHD doesn't arise from bad parenting and therefore improving parenting is not gonna change ADHD very much, but it does improve compliance. It does reduce stress and conflict. It does improve oppositional defiant behavior. And since most ADHD children do develop oppositional and defiant behavior, then most parents are going to need a parent training program to help them learn more systematic, more effective ways of 
dealing with their child to make their child more successful and effective. Please notice that parent training works best for young children below 11 years of age, where we find that 65 to 75 percent of families tell us that there is a noticeable improvement in their child, in their family, in themselves as parents from using these behavior management techniques. However, by the time we get to adolescence, only about 25 to 35 percent of teenagers and their families report improvement in their levels of conflict uh, and oppositional behavior by that age. And that makes sense because as children grow older, as they become teenagers, they're spending more and more time away from home, a lot less time with their parents. There's a lot less opportunity for parents to influence the teenager. Also, psychologically, the teenager is separating from their parents' influence, becoming more independent, wanting more of a say in what happens to them. Uh, and that will lower the likelihood that the parents can have some impact on that teen. And then, of course, the teen is coming under the influence of the peer group, which increases in its influence over teenagers. Uh, so for all of those reasons, these parent training programs don't work quite so well. We will offer them to families if they want them, but with the understanding that the majority won't necessarily benefit from them. We have to do other things like work with the school, like pay attention to the peer group, or add medication in order to help that teen deal with behavior away from home. Now, another thing that is very evidence-based is doing behavior management in school. And I have an entire lecture as well as my book, Managing ADHD in School, that goes through 80 to 100 strategies for working with children within the school system to improve their success, reduce their problem behavior, uh, make them more effective at meeting the demands of school. Uh, so lots of information out there on school behavior modification and behavior management techniques as well. But here again, as with parent training and other psychological treatments, they only work for the person who uses them and they only work where they're employed. So if a teacher is working with a child in school using these methods and other teachers are not, those other teachers will not see any long-term or any benefit from what that one teacher is doing. They're going to have to get on board to do these strategies when they have the child in their classroom if they expect to see the benefits from the treatment. And the same is true of parent training. If only one parent is using the methods, the other parent is not likely to see much benefit uh, from the behavior management training. So we need to make sure that caregivers who are working with ADHD children uh, are using the methods where and when they need to use them when the child is under their care. I've already mentioned routine exercise. I won't repeat myself about that. It's quite valuable uh, as a way of coping with ADHD. About 40% of ADHD children have sleep problems, so finding ways to improve their sleep can improve their daytime attention span uh, and therefore make their ADHD a little better. So children with sleep problems should be evaluated by their doctors for uh, whatever intervention they might need to address that problem. Here are the various parent training programs that are available in North America. Uh, other countries may or may not have these programs or might have some similar to them or based upon them, but going under different names. Uh, so there's a lot of different programs out there for parent training. They're all very similar. They all teach similar skills. They all have similar results. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to say that one is any better than the other. You'll see that my program at the top, Defiant Children, is the one, of course, that I developed and that I use. But these other programs do very similar things at what they teach parents to do. And the things they do, you see here, now, all of these programs are teaching parents to reduce their level of conflict and emotion, to be more consistent, more quick, more immediate, to increase their level of attention, and praise for good behavior and to rebuild a positive relationship with the child while also improving the way they reward children for complying with requests and tasks and demands, uh, including using not just praise, but also tokens, points, sometimes food or snacks, electronic privileges and so on. Whatever rewards the child, that's what we're going to teach parents to use to back up 
uh, a child's behavior when they behave to reinforce it. And then, of course, teaching parents not to talk so much, not to repeat their commands, not to delay uh, the consequence for the child's behavior, because that just weakens the effectiveness of the consequences and the commands. So we teach parents to back up what they ask with a consequence, either positive or negative, uh, depending on what the child has done, of course, and to do that within 10 seconds of the child doing what was expected or refusing to do what's expected, and then you act very quickly. And of course, if the child refuses to do what they ask, we don't allow them to do other things until they have complied with the request. So I've talked about the effectiveness of parent tra training declining with age as we get to adolescence. No need to review that. I've mentioned that these programs differ very little uh, both in what they teach, but also in their effectiveness. So they're all pretty good. Use whatever ones you're able to get your hands on. Uh, they mainly work on oppositional behavior more than on ADHD behavior, but that's good because most ADHD children have trouble with stubbornness, defiance, noncompliance, and, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, uh, providing information about ADHD and related disorders and providing professional support to the families also improves behavior. Just knowledge is power. Knowledge is helpful for families when they come to understand what ADHD really is. Now, I did mention that psychological treatments do produce side effects, and you will see many of them listed on this slide. Time doesn't permit me to go through each and every one of them. Uh, but uh, please have a look at these because about 10 to 15 percent, uh, as many sometimes as 20 to 25 percent in families with teenagers, do experience some increase in distress, in conflict with their child or teen, uh, within their own family or their own marriage. Uh, sometimes in younger children, we might see an increase in anxiety. Um, some people report an increase in certain kinds of uh, traumatic uh, episodes that they re-experience if they were traumatized. That's especially true when we are trying to use mindfulness meditation as a psychosocial treatment with people with ADHD. Uh, sometimes we see an increase in aggression where when you try to set limits and place demands on a child and be very consistent in doing so, uh, the child reacts negatively and may become more hostile, more defiant, more aggressive. Uh, and that's a side effect in some families. Uh, and of course, we sometimes see uh, that some families simply don't benefit. They're, they're not effective in helping those families with that particular child. Um, so for these and other reasons, clinicians need to monitor their patients when they do psychological treatment, ask specifically about whether ad any adverse effects are occurring as a result of what we're teaching you to do with this child, both at home and at school. There are side effects at school too. So uh, we need to be more vigilant, be more systematic, more direct in asking families about the adverse effects of what we're trying to train this child to do, because sometimes they do happen. There are a few experimental programs I'll just notice or, or take note of here. Uh, these are not yet evidence-based. We need more research on them to support them as truly effective treatment. There's a very promising program for social skills training called Friendship Coaching being developed at the University of British Columbia by Dr. Mikami. Uh, and uh, hopefully that program will be available soon in treatment manuals that people can purchase. Uh, it's a very good program. The reason I like it is because generally social skills programs, the way they're traditionally done, do not help ADHD children. Uh, so we don't recommend them. But Dr. Mikami has redesigned uh, social skills programs based on the executive function theory of ADHD, and she is getting some very good uh, promising results with that. There's an after-school program available in some cities in the United States called Challenging Horizons. It's for teenagers. It's done at the high school, after school, for a couple of hours each week. Teens come together as a group uh, who have ADHD, and they work with paraprofessionals or other school staff who are going to tutor them, meet with the teachers and give them advice on school management, spend a few sessions with parents giving them advice on home behavior modification and management, 
teaching social and sports skills and so on. So it's a nice little package that goes on several hours each week after school. And the reason it's done at the school is so that teens don't have to leave school to go get treatment and they're more likely to comply and participate when you make it easier for them and less stigmatizing for them to do so. There's some evidence that we can do some organization and time management training with teenagers with ADHD to help them with their homework, with their schoolwork, to be better organized, to use their time better. And we work with their parents and teachers to learn these same skills. Uh, Dr. Joshua Langberg here at my university, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, has developed a manual that's been tested several times. It's getting very good results. It's uh, available for purchase uh, called the POSS system for organization training. So it's very good at helping teens with their homework and schoolwork. There's been a little bit of interest in developing curriculums for preschool children who might go on to develop ADHD or other executive problems. These initial pilot studies did show some promising results, but that's all they were. They were very small studies. They did not involve clinically diagnosed ADHD children. Uh, they did not go on and follow the children. Uh, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done before we can say that we've got a good curriculum for helping preschoolers with ADHD in school. Uh, some people are getting some very promising results with mindfulness meditation, more with adults with ADHD, to some extent with teenagers, not so much with children. Uh, although a couple of studies did claim positive effects, others are not finding it to be so good with kids. So uh, in the future, we might see mindfulness and meditation training, helping people with ADHD to better manage not just their symptoms, but also especially their distress and their emotion regulation problems. So watch for that. Uh, some studies have tried transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is sending a strong magnetic uh, field into certain regions of the brain uh, using a small transmitter, and that changes the functioning of that brain tissue. Uh, and uh, to date, we have not seen any good positive results in rigorous studies. Most studies find no effect or mixed effects uh, from these, and most of the research is very poor. So at this point, uh, this treatment that originally was used for depression doesn't seem to help people with ADHD too much. There was one study out of Los Angeles using a, uh, a method called trigeminal nerve stimulation. It's a device where the child wears a headband while they sleep. The headband emits a very low electrical current into the brain. This is believed to stimulate the trigeminal nerve and the networks that it's connected to in the brain. And it's believed that that would help improve the functioning of the ADHD brain regions that might be connected up with this particular nerve. Uh, one good study, pilot study, found that after weeks, I believe it was 12 to 14 weeks of using this, they did find improvement over a placebo where the children were using the device, but it wasn't sending the signal into the brain. So it was a very good study, but it is only one study and it needs to be replicated. Uh, right now, this treatment is only available in the US by prescription from a physician, and it has to be done under a doctor's care. I have not heard that it's available anywhere else in other countries as yet. There's one pilot study out of England uh, that uh, is looking at uh, using magnetic resonance imaging, functional imaging of imaging the brain and particular centers in the brain as to how active they are uh, using fMRI uh, and then feeding that signal back using a video game to help teens learn how to increase activity in the brain through improving their performance in the game. Uh, they did get positive results from this biofeedback study, but I want to emphasize this is fMRI biofeedback, not the commonly available EEG biofeedback, which is not effective for ADHD. This treatment is not available. As I said, it's a small pilot study. Maybe it will be available in the future. Uh, we have done a number of experiments in our country looking at the omega-3 and 3-6 uh, fatty acids delivered in uh, fish oil capsules. Uh, 
Originally, companies who manufacture this claim that it benefited ADHD. Uh, the subsequent studies by other people, particularly that were rigorously done, did not find that to be the case. Fewer than 25% of the children improved was mainly in attention, if that. Uh, and as a result, uh, we do not recommend omega fatty acids for management of ADHD. Finally, we'll conclude with this list of treatments not to do because either we studied them and they don't work or we're not going to study them because they just don't make any sense. Like chiropractic skull manipulation uh, has no basis in science or theory as to why that would help uh, improve ADHD by massaging the skull. Uh, we've tried removal of sugar and other additives from the diet. That has not been very successful. Sugar does not increase ADHD, so removing it doesn't do much good, at least for behavior anyway. Uh, we've tried various uh, substances being added into the diet, like megavitamins or antioxidants, like the uh, drug pignogenol, uh, or adding minerals uh, and supplements, and we've not found this to be very effective. Now, some children are deficient in certain vitamins, particularly vitamin D. When it comes to ADHD, those children need to have vitamin D supplements or iron supplements because some children with ADHD are low in iron and maybe that might help them a little bit with their ADHD, but it's not a cause of their ADHD uh, and therefore improving it isn't going to help that much. And also most children with ADHD don't have these vitamin or mineral deficiencies and therefore adding more of them into their diet isn't going to make any difference. Uh, there's exercises that occupational therapists do, sensory integration training. Uh, that has not done well for ADHD children. We don't recommend it. I've obviously dealt with chiropractors already. Play therapy and psychotherapy are not helpful for ADHD even if they're helpful for other conditions like depression or anxiety. Teaching children to control their own behavior has not been successful in our studies with ADHD. This is often called cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and we've not had good success with it. I've already mentioned social skills training. When it's done in the standard treatment forms, it is of no benefit for ADHD at this point. And then, as I've said, EEG biofeedback, often called neurofeedback, has been studied extensively now uh, in the US and in Europe. And most recently, a large number of big studies, well done, rigorous procedures, using a placebo, a form of sham biofeedback, making sure that parents and teachers were blind to who got the real treatment and who didn't get it. When that kind of research is done, Uniformly, it shows no benefit of neurofeedback beyond the placebo effect. So it's mostly placebo. There's a lot of interest in developing games, apps for smartphones and tablets that people can play and practice and maybe improve certain brain functions. To date, there is no evidence that these games are able to do so. Now, mind you, despite there being only 300 or so games and apps out there that might uh, be uh, recommended for improving ADHD symptoms, there's only one study, and that study was a treatment failure. So at this point, despite the excitement about using technology, it's not all that useful at this point for ADHD children. So I hope you've seen that the best treatment for ADHD is a combination of medication with science-based psychological therapies, parent training, school management, accommodations in both places, as well as counseling of families and teaching them about ADHD. Put it all together, that's a very good treatment program for people with ADHD. We've seen new discoveries in De delivery systems for stimulants. We've seen some new medications over the last 20 years, like Stratera, like the antihypertensive drugs that might be helpful. We're beginning to see people trying to develop newer psychological treatments, uh, particularly social skills training and organization and time management training for teenagers. So that might be helpful. But in general, we have to face the fact that we are dealing with a chronic condition in most children 
but one that we can manage very effectively with the available science-based treatments. We can safely say that ADHD is a highly treatable disorder, one of the most treatable psychiatric disorders that we deal with in terms of the amount of treatments we have, the diversity, the impact of those treatments, what percentage of people respond, it's all good. So uh, despite this being a chronic condition, it is manageable, often manageable quite successfully. The biggest problems we still face, at least in my country, is getting access to all of these treatments for most families living in most communities, trying to keep the cost of them down, and then getting patients to stay in treatment and comply with treatment. Thank you very much for paying attention and watching this lecture. I hope you found it informative. Have a good day.